It's after six o'clock, so let's call our meeting of the Soquel Creek Water District Board to order. Roll call, please. Director LaHue. I am here. Vice President Lather. Here. Director Jaffe. Here. Director Christensen. Here. And President Daniels. Here for now. So uh, at this point, we're going to go into closed session. And so it's time for any public comment on that closed session. And I think there is one such comment. Correct, we have one. Ms. Steinbrenner? Hello, can you hear me? This is Becky Steinbrunner. Yes, we can hear you. Hello, thank you. Um, season's greetings to you all, and I hope that your power has all returned. It has returned to our place here in the mountains. So um, there were over 12,000 people affected by that outage. I want to say that um, I, I am pursuing the legal action that you're going to be discussing tonight. I did file my reply brief with the 6th District Appellate Court, and I do intend to ask for oral argument. And um, again, I want to ask you to please reconsider your, your actions. Um, I have sent you just, <laughs> it was delayed with the power outage, but I have sent your, your board and your clerk a courtesy notice that I do intend to file further legal action um, within the 30-day notice window of your approval on November 17th of the revised Pure Water SoCal project. And um, this, this really needs to be a supplemental EIR, not the simple um, addendum that you've taken that uh, does not require you to put it out for public review. I am concerned about many issues in this revision and I think they are substantial enough that you should be doing a subsequent EIR and putting it out to public comment. I do not understand with your um, transparency awards that you've gotten that you are not taking this action on such a significant project that will affect the schools in the area with the increased chemical storage that you would be putting on site the um, over 700 more truckloads in construction in the neighborhood in Santa Cruz. Um, there are so many things that this needs to be addressed uh, and let the people have a chance. To Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Okay, so at this point, we will go into closed session. So everyone needs to log out of here and log into the other uh, connection, including me. Okay, so, gosh dang it. Carla, you also have to leave the Zoom. Okay, where am I? All right, how do you leave this? Got all these things here. How do you? Oh, there it is. Never mind.
Okay, so we're almost all back. Just waiting for Tom. The slow one in every group. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, there's Tom. I'm here. Okay, so it looks like we're all put back. Um, we had a, a closed session. We talked about those three items and no decisions were made. So we now go on to the public hearing item 2.1, a public hearing about a variance request for a subdivision. Yeah, hi, good evening, uh, board. This, uh, this is one of the largest subdivisions that I think the district has um, served recently. Um, the Aptos Village um, project um, was brought to the board back in 2015. And, you know, a lot of work has been done since that time. The, the water mains, the fire hydrants, and basically half of the, the development has been uh, installed and is is in service, the structures are up, the businesses are open. I think the residences may all be occupied or at least sold. Um, the applicant, the, uh, the agreement, the subdivision agreement um, did provide a two year extension. It was a five year subdivision agreement with a, a two year extension subject to the board approval. And um, so that we are now at the end of the five years. <clears throat> And when we were discussing the, uh, the next steps with the, the developer, they actually requested that we ask, we bring to the board um, more than just two year extension. And their, their uh, justification for that is included in attachment one, where they reference um, a couple items. And, and I will say, uh, understandably working with the railroad and the regional transportation commission to commission a, a new rail crossing, um, which is a con condition uh, before they can start phase two is that they need to finish um, a rail crossing there, which is, is not ready. It's not in yet. So there's, there's been some coordination and, and um, planning on their side that is, not moved as quickly as anticipated. They also make reference to uh, the impacts due to COVID-19. So tonight uh, before you, and we need to remember to open the public hearing to take in public comment, is a request to uh, potentially honor or approve a four-year extension versus a two-year. The, the two-year is listed as motion five in case the board does not want to move forward with a four-year. The other option that they did, um, they, they could, uh, could work with was a two-year extension now and, and with another two-year extension subject to the board approval in 2022. Um, 
So I will leave it at that um, and let you guys open the public hearing, take in comment, and then I can be available for any questions. Josh? One thing I noticed is that item one is by motion. And I don't think we've ever done that. It's always been the presiding officer, the president, who calls for the open public hearing. Uh, that's a good point, President Daniels. Um, items one and two can be done by the presiding officer if, if that's the board's pleasure. Um, well, we've always done the close by motion, but uh, we've never done item one by motion. So, okay. So yeah, the Brown Act doesn't require a motion for either either one or two. Okay. Well, I will open the public hearing myself, and we are ready to receive public comment. Great. We have one, President Daniels. Okay. Ms. Steinbrenner. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I'd like to ask if there is anyone, uh, because I'm only on the telephone, is there anyone there from Swenson that is uh, here to answer questions? Well, no one's here to answer your questions. <laughs> well, you can thank talk you. To the, you can talk to the board. You can't right. ask questions. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm just curious to see if anyone from Swenson is there to answer your questions. Um, I'm curious about this, and um, having heard your board discuss uh, another development uh, last at your last board meeting on December 1st, the, the dwellings at 5701 Silkel Drive, they had to pay everything in full up front. And I'm curious why um, Swenson Builders has been able to get a variance for resolution 74-55, which I don't see... Um, and I'm having a little trouble with my computer system. I don't see it attached to the um, the packet, and I've done a search on your website and cannot find a copy of the actual resolution 7455. But I'm curious what um, findings and how the board was able to make the findings that strict enforcement of the district policy would cause the property to be deprived of privileges enjoyed by other similar properties. It claims that you are not granting special privileges. Seconds. And thank you. And um, that payment in full is not required. This amount would be substantial. It's 1.3 million dollars that the that they should pay you, and a five hundred and thirty-eight thousand dollar bond. I think you should reconsider this given the dire financial uh, status of your district and in consideration of your ratepayers. So I urge you not to uh, extend this, this thing. And the problem is eminent domain. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Okay, any other public comment? No. Okay, all right, um, then we bring it back to the board. Um, What's your pleasure? Tom, do you want to talk first? Um, I, I was going to move that we close the public hearing. Okay. I'll, I'll second. That was uh, Bruce. Dr. Jaffe. So we have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Director LaHue. Yes. Vice President Lather. Yes. Director Jaffe. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. And President Daniels. Yes. Okay, Tom, do you have any comments or questions on this? No, I mean, I, I, I think it's fine. We've given everything to grant an extension and I'm fine with four years. Okay, um, Rochelle? Yeah, I was a little confused then why would we have so many options, but um, um, I don't see them being able to be done and in, in less than four years just because of the state of the union at this point and I think we need to be supportive of that. Okay, uh, Mr. Jaffe. Yeah, I just had some questions for, for staff. Um, and I don't know if, if um, Taz is the right person or other people are, can answer, but I just want to uh, see from the district's point of view whether there's any negatives that staff thinks would occur if we were to extend for four years. And also whether or not there's, there's any, you know, 
giving an option in two years to bring this back, whether there's any uh, advantage to that versus extending to four years now. Um, well, I, I, I said it in my uh, update in my report that the, uh, the, the water main is in service and the services for the structures that are in place are installed and in are, have active accounts. Um, the service lines are actually installed already for the other phase two buildings. Um, I, I guess the downside is, is we wouldn't have service um, charges, um, but you know, there's no meters in, installed, there's no buildings there. So there's really not much, you know, the, the main is active, but it's not serving anybody. Um, you know, there is a, an added benefit to the district and other customers that that, that development helped uh, open up a bottleneck that we had crossing the railroad tracks um, so that that 12 inch water main does improve uh, service on that side of the railroad. So the, the disadvantage is, is a financial disadvantage or to, to granting an extension uh, or? Pretty I, much the, the, the remaining construction is essentially sidewalk work. I mean, if you've driven through there, the, the road is built. Uh, there are no sidewalks in phase two, but you know the, the service lines have been stubbed out and capped. So it's really, there's not a ton of uh, you know, construction to do, infrastructure remaining. And, and generally speaking, these agreements are, are mainly driven by infrastructure agreements and fees but in infrastructure requirements, um, the infrastructure, I'll just say this, that the, the bond for the maintenance of the facility, we still have not accepted the, the, the infrastructure as complete or the project as complete. So we will have, you know, an additional two years at the point in time that we do agree, uh, accept this, you know, let's just say it's another four years there'll be an additional two years on top of that for the maintenance bond. So, you know, we're covered as far as uh, it is still, if there's an issue, we would call the developer and, and tell them to go fix it. And we can do that uh, up until two years after the board accepts it as complete. Um, in fact, it's happened before. We had an issue with one of the a valve and um, we just noticed a, a valve lid that was mismarked. So we call them up and they took care of it. But yeah, we do have a bond. They did pay uh, roughly half of the water capacity fees and that, that has been received. The, um, the remaining water capacity fees are held in a, in a bond. So they're essentially guaranteed to pay those. We just don't have the, the money in the bank. Let's let Carla go next then. If you're finished, uh, Jeffy. Um, yeah, I, I have. I might have something later. It looks okay. like Tom has something also. Yeah, he does. But let's let Carla do hers, and we'll come back to Tom. Carla. Okay. Well, I uh, I was gonna agree. I was gonna agree that uh, the four year sounded pretty good, and with a progress report after two years instead of a formal uh, request for another variance, it would just be a progress report for the board at about this time, two years from now. Uh, you know, I'm not, I don't, you know, I, we reviewed and approved this project in, you know, five years ago. So I feel comfortable about that part. Okay. Tom, do you have a question or comment? No, I was just gonna mention that, you know, while um, you, know, you don't get the service fees, you also don't have water being used. So there's, you know, an advantage to putting off any additional water use as long as possible, in my opinion. Okay, well, I think it's my turn now. Um, I think this is, in fact, this, this thing talks about a privilege enjoyed by other similar properties. And I don't think, I think this is already out of the limit. Uh, I, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, that if one was to do a, 
a big project, a shopping center or whatever, one would pay these fees at the time of hookup. And then, you know, the project could, you could spend years actually doing all the construction, but you'd have paid for it up front. Is that not the case for the standard arrangement? Yes, that, that's correct. And so these people already have a something that no one else has ever gotten, which is the ability to delay their fees. So we could even talk about delaying this for a thousand years. And you know, let, let, let's talk about the end of the century. We'll we'll get our fees then. And that's that's really what we're doing is we're just allowing them to go ahead without paying anything. They can go ahead and build everything they want. There's nothing to stop them. This is not something that we're having to do with when they finish the project. This is when they get to pay for the project. And all, the thing we've always done is you pay for the project when you first get connected. And that's happened like years ago. And, uh, and so we are granting them something that no one else has gotten. That's what we did. The reason we, we gave them this five-year thing was, you know, they they applied for it way back when, and they were able to convince, you know, three of the board members to do that. Um, but I'm I'm not I'm not willing to give them more time for free um, because I don't think they deserve it. They're getting something that no one else has ever gotten, and to give them more of that same large yes is just wrong. So that's my comment. So anyone want to? Well, I just, think? I guess um, I, maybe I'm not understanding correctly, but that they, I thought that they paid all the water capacity fees, but this was just more the service agreements. There was a, um, a request and the board approved it back in 2015 that in lieu of, I mean, essentially they did pay it through a bond. Uh, we don't, it's a promise. And then what they did was when phase one was coming online before we dropped in the water meters, they paid us the water capacity fees for those meter drop-ins for phase one. And so what's, what is remaining is the, the, the water capacity fees for phase two. And it's, it's roughly half, it's 500,000. It was 1.1 million, I think, or 1.2 million total. When they start doing that up front, they get to do it at the end. So right. they're, but they're not water, using. I think Bruce Baker took a good point. What what water capacity fees do they pay? The ones at the time when they um, when this was approved, or the ones at the end? As it's written now, it's the ones that were in in effect in 2015 when the uh, original subdivision agreement was executed. Yeah, I, I think we did grant something that we haven't grant, granted other, other um, hmm. groups or people, um, but we did it. So I think that uh, they, they planned, made, they made all their plans based on that. And they're asking us just to go two more years because of reasonable delays. So are you proposing, uh, President Daniels, that we require them to pay the fees now that, or after the would, years? That's what I would agree to, yes. I mean, we clearly granted them a special dispensation five years ago, and I'm not interested in giving them special dispensation again for two or four more years. I would like them to behave like everyone else now. And they can go ahead and build it and finish it and everything, and they'll just pay the fees up front like everybody else does. Another another option that I because I, I don't know whether they have have that money in hand. The other option that we do the current um, approach that we take with applicants is there's a, a recorded document that stipulates that they pay the water capacity fees at the time of the the meter drop. So that's another way that, yes, we wouldn't get it up front, but we would get current, um, current fees at a, whatever time that, you know, they get to that. 
And that's common, Taj? That's the way That's it is. actually, well, what happens is, is currently they pay at the time of the subdivision agreement, they pay the current fees, okay? <laughs> um, and then any Delta, um, they would pay the difference, the increase as years, say there's one or two years beyond, normally it's a two year uh, agreement because this was a, a relative, a very large development, you know, you're not going to do it in two years, even if you went straight through, it took, it took longer to do that. So that's why they asked for five years um, with a, with an extension of two, but in, in normal smaller subdivisions that say could be finished in two years, they pay the, the fees in effect at the time the board considers the, the agreement. And then if, if they don't get it done in, in the time, in, in like that year, they pay the difference. Um, if, if the water capacity fees go up, they would pay the difference for each lot at the time they apply for their water meter. And do, that, do they always go up or do they ever go down? Um, <laughs> Inflation uh, they, always goes up. It, yeah, it's, it's based on on cost of living inflation and Les is Leslie on the call? Maybe not. Um, she she it's just. I am Taj. It's based on the um, engineering's uh, ENR's uh, CCI cost construction index for the Bay Area for San Francisco, and it goes and it's based on the March um, CCI numbers. And so conceivably it could go down, but it hasn't done so in in the last five or six years that we've been tying it to the uh, CCI. And I might add, uh, Taj, correct me if I'm wrong, but my memory says that actually the approach that you're describing where people, developers pay at the time and then they pay the increase to the point if it increases when they actually go do it, that policy was subsequent to this uh, agreement. Is that correct? Am I that, right? That you're, you're correct, Ron. Yeah. Just another piece of information I wanted to make sure the board had. Yeah. And on a practical note, so when would the meters tend to be dropped in in the progress of, of their ongoing construction? Before any well, it, it typically hinges upon us verifying the water use efficiency requirements. Um, mm -hmm. So the fixtures need to be installed. Um, and, and Roy generally does his inspections to verify that they meet the commitments and minimum requirements. Um, and of course, fees need to be paid. We usually withhold um, meter drops until those are paid. But, but other than that, just, just a fact that we need to verify um, the water use efficiency requirements are, are done. And, and usually it's that also the construction, all the construction um, requirements are met. In this case, you know, 95% or 98% of the construction has been finished. It's literally the sidewalks and the, um, the meters and the submeters that need to be put in. Some of the backflow devices have not been put in. The bigger, you know, bigger fire services and things like that are not in. But um, so when do you? I'm just meant wondering when you would estimate that meter drop oh. would happen. Oh, I. You know what? I wish I wish they were on the line to answer that. I. I don't not. Um, I'm not engaged in their schedule. They. They did provide that letter, but. Um, attachment one it it doesn't stipulate you know they say that uh if all goes well they hope to break ground on the new crossing that's the railroad crossing in spring of 2021 it's expected to take three to four months barring any delays once crossing improvements are built only then can they pull the building permit and start on phase two um, I thought you said most of like 95% of the construction is done. Well, no, that they, when they say construction, they mean the, uh, the structures. I'm, I was talking about the actual water infrastructure oh, okay. under, 
street. So it's going to take some time to build the structures. Right. So they won't be using the water until the structures are built. Correct. I'm with Tom. I'd rather they don't use water for as long as possible. So I don't see problem with that. For, for better or for worse, you know, I mean, I, I agree with Bruce Daniels in that we don't want to be unfair to anybody. We should be treating everybody equally. But um, for Sounds like you know they're working on this agreement that was made five years ago, um, and it seems like a bit unfair to then just suddenly change the expectations for that as well. Well, the only thing that was in the original contract was the possibility of an additional two-year extension. Right. The four years was not even discussed at that point. So there potentially would be advantage of doing the two year and then they could come back and ask for more. Just as far as fairness. And that's um well any more discussion or does someone want to try and craft a motion or what are we going to do? I think I'll go ahead and make a motion to go with motion number four, the two year extension, but then they would have to come back to us for an additional two years. And at that point, because we, or maybe just, yeah, right, number four. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. I, I, okay, we've got a motion in a second, but I have a question about number four. We've been talking about the fact that for number four, they would have to come back to the board for the additional two. I don't see that in that motion. Well, it's subject to board approval in two years. Where is that? Uh, okay. Right. Oh, okay. Okay, I see it. Okay, got it. All right. So, so we have a motion and a second, so roll call, please. Director LeHue? Yes. Vice President Lather? Yes. Director Jaffe? This is middle ground, I'll, I'll vote yes. Director Christensen? Carla, you're muted. Yes, I'll go along with the rest of the board on that one. So yes on number four. And President Daniels. A no for me. Okay, so that pop, uh, passes four to one. And so we now go on to the consent agenda. So does anyone wish to pull anything from the consent agenda? Tom? Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll remove item 4.2 for the public. Sure. Okay. Rochelle? I'm sorry, I was going to look at the list of requested items to be pulled. Um, move on to somebody else while okay, they get a chance to, to look at come it. Come back to you. I, Mr. I, was Jeffy? I was doing the same. I think there was another item that was requested. So 4.2. No, there was just a general uh, okay. 4.0, but I'll, okay. I'll pull uh, just to comment on four point, an item in 4.4, .4, I guess. If it's just a comment, you don't have to pull it. That's, yeah, yeah so I don't, I don't necessarily want to pull it. I just want to alert okay. myself to that. All right. So when we get to the consent agenda, that's item four, you can make your comment. Okay, so anyone else? Let's see, uh, Carla? I don't have any to pull. I just want to comment on something in 4.4. Okay. All right. Uh, so I have nothing either. So I need a motion for the rest of the items. I'll move to approve the rest of the items. I second. Okay. Actually, uh, we have a, I guess we don't have a public comment on this now because we did we, pull 4.2, which was 
Oh, they're right. still, they're Ms. still, they're Ms. still. Steinbrenner, yeah. Ms. Steinbrenner has asked to speak on 4.0 as a whole. So let's do that before the motion. All right. Ms. Steinbrenner. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrenner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I just as a follow up on your last item, the big issue for that crossing is going to be getting control of the private crossing next door. They have to declare eminent domain. And that could take quite a long time to close the Bayview Hotel crossing. That is a condition of getting their new Parade Street crossing. So I just wanted to let you know that. It may take some time. Um, I appreciate you pulling um, item 4.2. I will go ahead and speak about it now and just say that on page 45, I noticed that consumption is down below your budget, uh, budgeted levels. So that harkens to what Raftelis had um, uh, predicted, a 3% production demand decrease when they figured out the new rate structure. So I'm hoping that you will have a good discussion about where everything is in terms of actual production, demand, and costs. Um, item 4.3, page 49, um, I see that production is actually up in the Aromas area. I wonder why there would be increased production in that area and caution because those are the most overdrafted areas according to your documentation and um, it would be a sad thing to exacerbate a problem. 4.3, page 80, um, I just note that the um, production weather index graph has not been seconds? updated since September. And um, I want to just jump then to page uh, 90, in the 90s, item 4.7. This goes also back to your variance for Swenson, the water capacity fees. Take a look at all of those that the other developers are having to pay. Finally, um, item 4.8, the water demand offset. I want to know if you have calculated the 18 acre feet that was required for development of the um, Twin Lakes Church well. Thank you, Ms. Steinberg. Okay. So we have all but 4.2 to be passed. Anyone wants, wish to make? Yeah, we already have a motion second, don't we? Correct. Okay. Roll call, please. Director LaHue? Yes. Vice President Lather? Yes. Director Jaffe? You're muted, Jeffy. Yes. Director Carla? Uh, yes. And President Daniels. Yes. Okay, so we will hear 4.2 at the end. So we now go to oral and written communications. Do we have anyone on the list? We do, yes. we have two people tonight. Okay. Let's start with Ms. Steinbrenner, Becca. Okay. Ms. Steinbrenner? Hello, this is Becky Steinbrenner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank Oops. you. Um, I would just like to support the uh, letters and very good study that Mr. John Cole has been sending to your board. I'm, I'm watching that very um, with great interest, and I urge you to really listen to what he's saying. Um, he sued you and won before, <laughs> and a, a customer should not have to do that. So please listen to him and adjust things that he brings to your attention. I also want to let you know at our my last time that uh, the Aptos, I thought the Aptos Library was open so that you could again begin providing hard copy of your very um, large <laughs> uh, agenda packets to the public who do not have access to Internet. Sadly, the library has closed again due to COVID. Um, and lastly, I, I just want to wish you all a happy holiday. I, um, I know we differ in many things, but we share the sincere uh, interest in the environment and making the world a better place. So I just want to wish you all happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Mr. Cole? Yes. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. 
Hey, folks, I'm just trying to convince you that you have a problem with your water rates. Uh, you now have my original letter, Leslie Strom's response to it, and my reply to her. So I'm hoping you can do something about it. Either brush me off like Leslie or do, do something and acknowledge that there is indeed a problem with the rates. Have Ruff tell us to investigate it. It's not premature now and it was not premature last year. Are we to believe that you would vote to have the Raftelis rate we have all done and then decide it would be too premature to have it done? Let's walk through another example. I got one more try here at this. I'm hoping that this will help convince you. Let's consider that each customer class consumes 10 units in a given month. Take commercial irrigation first. They are the simplest because they have a uniform rate. For 10 units, they are billed $117.70 because their rate is $11.77 a unit. Now take multifamily residences. If any one of them consumes 10 units, their bill is $70.10, which is $7.10 a unit. Lastly, consider single family. If they consume 10 units, their bill is $169.59, which equates to $16.96 a unit. So I ask you, what is the real cost to serve 10 units of water to district customers? If you look at the cost per unit served, is the unit cost 710, 1177, or 1696? You tell me. What if each class consumes 11 units? Well, for MFRs, commercial irrigation, the unit cost is still $7.10 and $11.77 respectively. But the SFR's unit cost jumps to 1831. Can you not see that there might be a real problem here? <sighs> I'm asking you to do something about this and I'm really, really hoping you are. So I thank you for giving me the time to, to issue my issues on it and maybe something will get done. Maybe you can get Raph Tellis in, what you need to have him do anyway. Um, and let's see what, what he comes up with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Okay, so that's it for public comment. Any board member comment? Tom? So specifically on? Anything. Well, public, com public comment sort of things. Okay, all right. So um, I guess I would just request that because there are, is some confusion and rather than reading emails back and forth, I would like to have a clarification from staff on the rate difference, particularly this thing between single family residents and multifamily residents. I just, I feel like I have tried to understand what Mr. Cole is saying, but I still, it seems like if you're in a duplex, two families, you know, they will still be subject to the same limits. So I'm, I need clarification at some future um, meeting hopefully soon on that specific thing. I would agree with you on that. Okay, uh, Rochelle, do you have anything? Um, I actually did spend quite a bit of time trying to um, figure out what mm -hmm. he was showing and I do understand it. I don't necessarily agree with it because um, what he's done is he's looking at it as a um, as a parcel. So one parcel with multi-family multi dwellings, it could be 16 or two. He's looking at it as the entire usage for the parcel. But what we're looking at it is per single, um, per dwelling unit. And so I don't disagree with the math, but I don't agree with the um, logic on that. I do um, agree at some point we should look at irrigation and how we build that because um, really we, we're trying to limit everybody's use of irrigation water, but we do have some commercial um, customers that have, you know, that's what they use it for. So it could be worthy of, of evaluating. I think that's very much uh, res with respect to our new uh, rate structure we've been talking about having in a few years. And so mm -hmm. 
maybe we can start talking about that in January when the staff brings that back to us. So that'd be good. Uh, Mr. Jaffe? Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Cole for his um, investigation into our rates and for bringing what he views as an inequity in, in the rates to our attention. And I, I second, third, or fourth, whichever it is, the idea that uh, we get clarification from our staff on this. Um, and um, I'd like to put out there that uh, one possibility is to have a little mini workshop. If, because it, I think part of the problem here is um, these meetings are uh, not back and forth and it's hard to really uh, get to the, 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 the crux of the matter by um, just having a public comment and then the format where um, the board then talks without going back and forth. So like to keep, keep that as a possibility of having a, a mini workshop. Okay, uh, Carla. Oh, thanks. Uh, you know, having, uh, I spent a little bit of time on Mr. Cole's uh, letters and Leslie Strom's uh, response. And I'm, I didn't see errors. I th errors in the district's thinking. I think uh, there's some, uh, we specifically ask for data to be presented and Leslie Strom did present it that way. And it was to make the data that we were looking at on consumption uh, jive with the Raftelis approach to our rate study. So I, I agree that there's a lot of potential for us to jigger this, uh, the rate structure again, and you know, and that the, uh, the finance, the rate meetings that we went through for a year and a half, it was, sometimes it was a little tumultuous. So Mr. Cole might fit right in there. Uh, but it, was, uh, it really did enlighten all the people who stayed with it to the end on exactly how challenging it is to set rate structures. But we now have a new tool. We have our AMI, the smart metering systems that might enable us to fine tune things because the whole emphasis is tier one is indoor family unit usage and the tier two was designed to catch outside irrigation. And we can see the Raftelis uh, approach to this whole rate structure uh, was exactly as he predicted. It's amazing that uh, he, you know, he's had enough experience to get that correct. So uh, correctly. So anyway, I'm looking forward to a future, you know, workshop or, you know, and then, a, you know, another rate committee, but I really don't find anything wrong with what the data that we were looking at in our finance report and the production reports. I just have to disagree with Mr. Cole on that one. Okay, uh, for me, um, first of all, since my term is coming up here very quickly, I want to thank everyone for your help and support and all the things we've been able to accomplish in the last year. It's been, I can't say easy, but it's been gratifying to see we've made progress. About the, the rates issue, one of the things you need to think about is the basis, the, the protocol for your rates. Um, you could have the rates based on uh, acreage so that you know a house that's built on a 20 by 70 foot lot like my house is, tiny little acreage, uh, I wouldn't have to pay much at all. Whereas someone on a you know, 12 acre parcel would be paying lots more. And there's some rationale there because if you had a large acreage, you could have lots of irrigation going on in my little tiny plot, uh, almost none. Uh, so that would make some sense. Uh, you could have it based indeed on on parcels, you could have it based on how many ha habitations you have on that parcel. Uh, you can have it based on um, uh, you know, persons. We've been talking about having a, uh, that as a possibility because 
it, it allows big families not to have to pay a lot more than small families, uh, um, uh, things like that. Um, but actually what we came up with, what Rotellus came up with was they wanted it to be based on um, flow demand. They had a particular term for it, I forget what that was, but it basically is if you make draws on the system for flow, for, for pressure, then you have to pay according to that. And the reason they picked the same thing for uh, uh, multifamily and single family was not that they use exactly the same amount of water, but that the flow demand on those two are very similar. And so given that the proposition there was that if you're making a demand on the system, that's what costs things. That's why you have to have you know, big pipes and big pumps and big wells and, and so forth. And the more of that you have, you have to spend time keeping those maintained and, and, and working and adding new ones as new people come on. And that was the whole theory. It was that it was flow demands that was the cost basis and therefore it should be the basis for, for charging. And uh, that may not be the right philosophy, but that's what we came up with. And, uh, and so we can sit here and argue about what it should be. And I think Efratelis did some studies to say that that was what they thought was the reasonable thing. But um, that's, that's the first thing you have to decide is the basis. And, uh, and then from there, you can talk about exactly what the numbers need to be. But that's an important thing. And I agree we should sit down and talk about it because that needs to be another basis for you know, whatever we come up with for future rates. Um, I was also going to mention that I uh, attended the, the aqua uh, meeting uh, on uh, groundwater this past week. Uh, one of the interesting things they were talking about the, the plans that have already been submitted and they were saying that uh, they're working hard on them and a lot of the plans out there for a particular basin have multiple plans uh, that in theory work together to, to manage the entire basin. Of course, we haven't done that. We have one plan for the entire basin. We have one agency for the entire basin. And they were saying that those will be done much faster and they'll probably be done in the first three months uh, of the year. So it means we will probably get our plan back one way or the other. And there are three ways you get it back. It's either approved with comments that you're supposed to then look at in the five year time frame. You could get it come back with, um, you need to fix these things before we approve it. And that thing gives you six months to do those things or they could deny it, in which case it goes over to the other side, which is the, the uh, water board, state water board. And basically you're put on uh, probation. And uh, if you can't fix those things, then uh, they take over the basin and they, uh, they manage it themselves. Um, so that was, I think for us, the biggest thing that was discussed. So I guess I'm done. Anyone, Tom, you have something else? Yeah, um, thank you very much for all your work as president this year, I appreciate that. And also I had mentioned that maybe staff could come back and whether it's a mini workshop um, to clarify some of those questions we have on rates. I'd also like clarification on the graphs because it, I have no problem with having, if it doesn't, you know, having data on monthly data on billings by customer class, if that's more transparent. Right. Okay, so then we move on to reports. District Council, do you have a report? Uh, thanks, President Daniels. Yes, I have a, uh, a brief one. I just wanted to make sure the board was aware of, uh, of two things that will take effect January 1st. Um, the first is an update to the FPPC's annual gift limit. Um, so this is one, the one part of the Political Reform Act that changes every two years based on inflation. Um, it previously was $500 a year, um, and that applied to 19 and, and 2019 and 2020. Um, the FPPC has released the revised amount for 2021 and 2022, and that'll be $520. Um, and as a reminder, that cap um, sets a maximum cap on the amount of gifts that a public official can receive in a calendar year, as well as um, sets the threshold for determining if there's a conflict of interest, if a, um, uh, a gifter, you know, if you've received gifts from someone um, exceeding that threshold in the previous 12 months. Um, the second um, update I had for the board is a, an, a bill that we had talked about previously, um, AB 992. Um, it was signed by the governor, takes effect at the beginning of next year. Um, and it adds a provision to the Brown Act to clarify how social media is handled. Um, 
So uh, the bill does two important things. The first it does, it explicitly clarifies that it is okay for public um, and elected officials to post on social media related to district business. Um, just as a side note, this is actually something that had never been in the Brown Act before. And I think sort of reflects the fact that in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a, pre, uh, it's a law that you know, is pre-modern technology. Um, so adding some clarity into the Brown Act on that point is, is, is a good thing. Um, the second thing uh, is it handles um, communications by board members through on social media in a way that is different from how all other communications between board members are handled under the Brown Act. I think it's really important to highlight that. So traditionally, when we're looking um, about Brown Act communications, it is always okay for one director to speak to one other director on an item of business outside of a meeting. And as long as um, those discussions aren't shared with or communicated to a third director, we don't have a Brown Act problem, right? So you're always looking for three when you have a serial meeting. This, this new law applies a different standard for social media posts. And what it says is that once one director has posted on social media, um, if another director responds, likes, comments, um, thumbs up, thumbs down, another director's social media posts, that creates a Brown Act problem. So starting January 1st, if any of you are using social media to talk about district business, um, please do not respond to, acknowledge, like, wink at, whatever it may be, um, another director's social media posts. Um, that is, that will, will not be permitted um, uh, going forward. Uh, happy to answer any questions on those, those items. Thank you. Josh, could you talk about the same thing on a different media? Like instead of Facebook, you did it on you know, something else? Uh, yeah, so um, the, the test there would be if they were somehow linked. Um, so, you know, some social medias, you can, you know, you can post on one thing and it'll show up on another, another forum. If that was the case and you were to respond on the separate forum, but it was clear it was part of one conversation, that would be an issue. But if they're just happenstance and they're completely unrelated and you weren't aware of the other posting, that wouldn't be an issue. It's really you only run into a problem where there's um, a, res a direct response to another director's social media post. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thanks, Josh. Okay, item 7.1, we have none of, no conditional or unconditional will serves. We now new, move to 7.2, certification of election and oath of office. Yes, so I'll just take the lead for that to hand it off to Josh. But, you know, as everybody knows, November 3rd uh, election, directors uh, Dr. Daniels and Dr. LeHue were reelected, and the county elections office has certified that. So Josh is here tonight uh, as our district council will administer the oath of office. Uh, so, uh, uh, thanks, Ron. Um, and if uh, uh, directors uh, could could be ready, I will uh, sort of if you just repeat after me. Okay. Um, so, I state your name. I Bruce Daniels. I Tom LeHue. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do that I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. domestic. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance. And that I will bear I true faith and allegiance. allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. State of California. And then I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And I, and I take this uh, oath with. Uh, I apologize. Obligation freely. Obligation. Mm -hmm. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. And that I will and truly discharge the duties in which I'm about to depart. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we now move to 7.3. 
Yes, and, and that, that's the first time I've ever seen that done by Zoom. Uh, good job. Uh, it's a little tough with the delay, but I could hear both of you coming through. So at this very point, I pass the baton over to Rochelle. She is now the president. OK. Congratulations, Rochelle. <laughs> Thank you. I'm listening to you and going, okay, I've got to improve some things on myself. So thank you for being such a great mentor. So um, what do I do, Ron? Do I give this to you about the... Yeah, I'll give a quick intro just to make it easy. You can take a deep breath, you know, your first item here. So uh, a while back, I think it was Director Christensen that came up with this idea that, you know, the vice president would move into the, the president's uh, position. And that's what the board has been doing for the last several years. So tonight, uh, what you're looking to do is elect the uh, vice president for the board, which would automatically become the board president next year. So as shown in the actions, uh, it's up to the board to nominate and call for a vote and pick your next uh, vice president. So, um, Bruce, you have something too. I wish to nominate Tom LeHue for vice president. Dr. Daniels, we have one public comment before the board discussion. Oh, okay. Oh. Ms. Steinbrenner? Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Congratulations, um, Ms. Lather, I, Director Lather. I really am happy to see you uh, at the helm, and I encourage this board to continue becoming, um, showing diversity in your leadership. Um, as much as um, Director LeHue and Director Daniels are worthy of a spot, um, they've been serving in those positions for a very, very long time. And that is part of why I'm really happy to see you there. I think we need to have women who are intelligent leading good groups like yours. And so I hope that you will um, nominate uh, Carla Christensen to support um, continuing this good policy of having a woman at the head of your agency. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my nomination stands. Is there a second? Um, I guess seeing that there is no second, I will second the, um, the nomination um, in order to take a roll call. Director LeHue? Yes. Director Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? I'm going to abstain. Director Christensen? Um, Uh, Becky somewhat stole my thunder, so I'll abstain also. Oh, this is... And President Lather. Um, I guess I, I need to try to figure this one out. Thanks a lot for putting me here. <laughs> well, Michelle, yeah, we could, you get paid so much more than we do. <laughs> what was that, Ron? I, I was saying you can you can reach out to Josh if you have questions on how to proceed. He's there to help. We're all here. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to, to ask him you know, about procedural. But President Lather, just as a procedural point, um, we have two votes yes and two abstentions. So um, a, a vote no or an abstention, the motion would fail. We need three affirmative votes. OK. Um, I'm going to abstain. Well, I'm going to say no right now because I want to see what the other options are. 
and we can always go back to a similar motion. That's correct. Yes, Bruce. I still vote. I still nominate Tom. Are there any other nominations? This is a tough one because I think actually both Tom and, and Carla would do good jobs. I'll, I'll nominate Carla. Okay, and is there a second? Once again, I will second the motion. <laughs> to um, keep this going. Roll call, Director LeHue. I'll abstain. <laughs> Director Daniels. Uh, I vote for Tom. Is that a no? I vote for Tom. That's a no. Got it. Director Jaffe. Five years ago, we flipped a coin. I'm abstaining. Director Christensen? Yes. <laughs> That's crazy. And President Lather. So we could actually flip a coin? <laughs> and That's what happened five years ago. We would need a motion, but the board could certainly flip a coin and you know decide in advance that they would vote for whatever the results of that were, just as, a, as an option. Yeah, and, and just for, to be clear, I think if my understanding was right, when we flipped the coin, we had four directors, just I just it wasn't five, but I think that's trying to get all the information out there. Okay, well, I'll vote yes. But what does that do? Nothing, right? Nothing. Emma, can you can you read back? Lost track. Emma, could you? Yeah, could you? bring us up to speed on the results of the votes. I got lost in the abstentions. Yes, so uh, Director LeHue abstained, Director Daniels voted no, Director Jaffe abstained, Director Christian voted yes, and President Lather voted yes. So the fails for lack of a, a three affirmative votes. Yes. Okay, so. Can I just make a little comment? Sure. Sure, I just, it's, um, so, I think Carla would do a great job and I think I would do a great job. I'm fine with, you know, I think our district will be in good hands either way. And I have nothing, you know, I just, my reason for still wanting to do this is just, you know, we worked for so long to work towards getting this, you know, this project and getting a sustainable groundwater base. And I just kind of wanted to see it through, you know, with, and that's, that's basically it. Uh, I'll speak up then. I, uh, as I said, I mentioned uh, Becky stealing the thunder. I appreciate both yours and uh, Dr. Daniel's uh, presidencies and the time that you spent for the district working for that. But I do feel like we need to open up, you know, you know pass the gavel much more widely than we have been in the past. I mean, originally when I first became uh, associated with the water district, uh, Dan Kriege ruled ruled the roost for years upon year upon year. And it, you know, with when Dr. Daniels came on board, it started to break up a little bit. But I think we can do, we can do much more than that. And I think it's really this is this is the time. And uh, in order to avoid uh, in order to avoid, however having to toss a coin, which I just utterly object to, I would withdraw so that if you really want to be the president, then you can. Can I not? Okay, so then we still have a, yeah, I mean, my, I have to say that being vice president taught me quite a bit. And it is um, a good thing for everyone to get a chance to do just because Eventually, you and um, and Bruce will consider, you know, 
moving on and not doing this anymore. And so I really did appreciate all that um, experience, but um, you've been reelected. So um, it's a little bit different. Last year, um, I was concerned that something might happen and one of you didn't get reelected. So I, um, anyway, so we do have a motion on the table still from Bruce Daniels nominating Tom LaHue. Do we have a second? Well, given what Carla said, I will second it. Okay. Emma? It looks like, it looks like uh, Dr. Daniels wants to say something. Oh, I can't see him. Well, look, the reason I, I in addition to Tom just being effective, is it, it's the president and the vice president who tend to be in the meetings together, make the decisions together, do the things together. And I thought it would be good to have, you know, Rochelle, who's new on the position, along with someone who was, you know, had done it lots before, which mm -hmm. would be Tom. And, you know, certainly we should think about doing Carla after Tom. So next year, we'd talk about having Carla be the second, and she would be behind Tom, and then she would become the president. And, you know, this, this, this assembly line thing would continue that way. But it's good to have at least one person in there who's done it before and kind of knows some of the problems and issues and has ideas of you know, how to deal with them already. So that's my thinking. I agree. So I, I, I see that as being definitely a benefit, especially for me. <laughs> yep. If I'm going to be um, the president, I like having some support that has experience. So that is, that is um, very thoughtful. Anybody else have anything to say? Okay. So Emma, would you please do the roll call? Yes. Director LeHue? Yes. Director Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Lather? Yes. That was hard. Yeah, it, it was very hard because they're both would do a good job. Indeed. Carla's put in a lot of time and effort, and, and I applaud that. So now we're at agenda item 7.4. 7 I was trying to scroll down. I'll say from a staff level, it's nice to have board members who, who do care so much, and we're here to support all of y'all. So 7.4, uh, again, these couple memos, I just want to recognize Emma. She's really been putting these together. And, um, uh, and I've asked her at her name. I'm going to see if she's got it on this one. I think she does. Yes, thank you, Emma. Tonight, you know, we have a lot of committees and a lot going on at the district. And so there's three standing committees. I think you all know them. They're not necessarily having change tonight. There is, we did give the option, there's a sentence in here that if you did want to reorganize or appoint new directors, you could, but the, the general term would run a little bit longer. So the, but what is available is the um, Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Agency. Uh, those terms are, are coming to an end, but they can automate, the same people can stay in there if you choose or Thank you. Yeah, if you go down that, thank you, Becca, by running that. That's perfect. And, or you could uh, select new board members in, in uh, the MGA or keep as is. Then the other one is Zone 5. Uh, Director Jaffe is currently serving on that. Uh, he may continue or you may appoint a new board member. LAFCO is really not up for discussion, but we like to give you the full breadth of all the committees because I think for us, it, it, or for me and Emma, it, it helps. So you can see everything to help do the all the other pieces. But Rochelle's currently serving on that. And you know, that's an elected position uh, and it's, it's uh, current through May, 2023. So 
no, really no discussion around that one. And then, but the other third one that is uh, open is the uh, Aqua JPIA board, which uh, Director Christensen currently serves on that. She could continue or you may appoint new representatives. And as in that one, um, the GM, the human resources manager and finance and business manager have, uh, I think as of last time, served as alternative representatives in case the uh, director does not want to attend, one of us would uh, take that action. So if we go down to the board actions there, uh, Becca, thank you very much. Uh, you can see there's the Mid-County, there's Zone 5 and Aqua JPIA. In addition to that, if you did, were inclined toward uh, changing the three standing committees, you could entertain motions on that too. Thank you. Okay, so now is the time for um, public comment. Do we have any? No, not on this item. Okay, then I will close public comment and move it back to the board members. Um, yes, Bruce? I would, I would like to make some changes for myself. I've been doing some of these committees for a long time. Um, I would like to get off the Mid-County Groundwater Agency and offer up to somebody else. And I'd like to get onto the outreach committee if someone would be willing to give that up. Carly, you're on the on the um, Mid County Groundwater Agency as an alternate. Alternate, are you interested in moving up? Um, well. No, I just I was going to drop out as the alternate actually because both uh, Dr. Lee Hugh and Dr. Daniels have been so good at uh, uh, participating in those meetings and they've been there all along and I think it's starting to wind down. I would probably say they should stay with that and finish it up. Um, I think uh, I'm not sure that there would be any point in someone going and trying to get up to speed with what's going on there. And uh, and I still am vitally interested in the outreach committee, so I don't want to give that up. So, so uh, anyway, but, but that's my feeling about the MGA having uh, shadowed, I've been shadowing the meeting, so I kind of see, see what's happening there, but um, you know, I think, Dr. Lee Hugh is the president of the MGA right now, and both of you have been very, very involved, and I thank you for that. Um, I was actually kind of interested in it. I was going to start um, shadowing the meetings, mm -hmm. um, but I was going to see if I could be an alternate. I wasn't so you can have my you can have my spot as the alternate for sure. If uh, Bruce wants, if Bruce Jaffe wants to be. Uh, I was, I've been involved with it, um, not as much the last couple of meetings I haven't gone to, but I'd, I'd be willing to do it. I think it's still a key part of our, mm -hmm. our, you know, how we fit into the water ecosystem here. Mm -hmm. important for us to work together. Okay. I'm, I'm just to know, um, there is a status update every year. And then I think it's what, four years from now, uh, there's the opportunity, in fact, a requirement to submit a new plan. It can be an update or change of the existing plan, but it's it, it could be very different. So that's gonna be starting up you know, probably in a year or so. so. Okay, so um, do we have to make a motion for this or this is just part of our discussion, right? We'll need a motion uh, to make the formal appointments, but we can defer motions in, until there's consensus on the positions. It's the board's pleasure. Okay, that would be good. I, um, Carla, are you still willing to serve on the um, blood control and the um, JPIA okay. board? Oh, the JPIA. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Dr. Jaffe is on the flood, the zone five. Oh, who's doing that now? Okay, sorry. Yeah. 
but I have I have to admit that the the meeting agendas haven't um, lured me into attending the meetings. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> Would you want to continue with that then, Bruce? Or I'd be happy to, in case there is a meeting agenda where I thought I could contribute. Well, but if I'd be willing to step down if somebody else wants to look at the agendas and see if there's a reason for us to be there. Yeah. Do we need to vote on that? To, to, if we're not making a change? Yeah, we still do. Okay. We reappoint the board member. So, okay. um, so and then the primary, so um, Carla, do you want to be reappointed to be the Aqua JPIA board member? Sure, you know, that's another one of those things like the zone five. <laughs> zone five so I think it's helpful to have an officer and that's, I've served serve that way. But, um, but anyway. So. And then the, um, the other committees, I don't think those committees need a motion, right? We could move around. Um, we would only need a motion if um, there's a, a desire to, to change the current um, uh, composition of those committees. If we are changing any of them, then we would need a motion to do that. Okay. So, so Bruce Daniels, you were, do you still want to, you said you wanted to be in public outreach, right? Yeah. So, if someone, if someone was, and Carla, Carla wants to continue with that. So, I'm fine if we want to um, put Bruce on public outreach and take me off or Bruce Jaffe, you're the alternate. I don't know how you feel about that. I'd, I'd be happy to either remain the alternate or, or make room for somebody else. Um, it's very important. I like to help out with some committee. So if, if, I, if I'm on, not on public outreach, I'd pray you like to help with the water, the infrastructure one, but. Would you like finance? You can have my position there. Actually, that's I have no offense to finance, but that's not an area I feel like I'm very good at. Um, I could, I would let you have my, um, my seat at the table for water resources management and infrastructure, if you like. Okay, well. Then Bruce. Although, you know, I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, and you have a lot of knowledge there too. So I don't know. Um, maybe I could just be the alternate and take Bruce's place and he could take place on the public outreach. That sounds good to me. Okay. Now, because I think Rochelle and Carla, Carla, you wanted to stay on that one too, right? So. Um, well, I, for, I had a different reason for being, wanting to be on that was just education, but you know, now we're, um, you know, someone else can be on it. I, I don't have a, I don't have a ownership of it by any means. But you're, you're on all three of them, so. Yeah, um, I've been doing that for a while. <laughs> but the finance one, I feel like I should probably ought to stay there now that I have gotten yeah. more up to speed on what's going on. So I feel like I should stay with that, but. Um, okay. So, so um, water resources, let's, then. let's put Tom in for um, water resources management infrastructure. And I'll stay because you know I love that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then Bruce will go into mm -hmm. public outreach, and then maybe mm -hmm. Carla could be the chair there again. Mm -hmm. Okay, did we sort that out? I think so. Somebody taking notes for me? Yeah. Pam, I'll read, before we do each motion, I'll read uh, my notes for each committee. Okay. So um, somebody needs to make a motion. Why don't you just go in order and have Emma state them out and we'll make a motion and approve it. Okay, so we're gonna add a motion because um, 
Okay, so we can start with the motion to appoint board members to the Santa Cruz Mid County Groundwater Agency. And my notes have at um, continuing with um, Bruce Daniels. Is that right? I offered it to someone else, but no one oh. said they wanted it. So I guess I'm still on. Or is so, it Tom? Would you like me to read my notes? Yes, uh, please. <laughs> Okay, so for the MGA, I have uh, Director Jaffe and Director LeHue serving, and okay. the alternate being Director Lather. Okay. So I need a, a motion. I make a motion for that. I'll second. Thank you. Okay, so. and roll call Director LeHue? Yes. Director Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Lather? Yes. Great. And uh, I'll just go down the list. So for the uh, zone five, I have uh, Director Jaffe continuing to serve on this. I make the motion. I'll second. Okay, so Director LeHue? Yes. Director Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Lather. Yes. Okay. And for the Aqua JPIA board, I have Carla continuing to serve on this. I make the motion. Second. I, we'd request a motion also include the staff alternates. Yes. Please. Yeah, we're going to do that next. Yeah. And appoint or reappoint staff alternates on the board. Oh. Okay. That's part of the motion. Who are the staff alternates? It is the general manager, the finance manager, and I believe the human resources manager. That's right. I okay. add them to my motion. Thank you. Second. And roll call Director LeHue? Yes. Director Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Lather? Yes. So the, so the next motion would be for the reconfiguration of our committees. Yes. yes let me... a single motion if the board would like. Okay, so let me, um, if we're going to do it in a single motion, I'll read each um, committee. Becca, do you mind scrolling up to the first page, please, um, of this memo? Thank you. Okay, okay so for uh, the WRMI, I have uh, Director Lather and I have Director LeHue and the alternate, I have uh, Director Christensen. I think that's right. Okay, good. That was the one I was worried I didn't keep up with. <laughs> okay, for, for public outreach, I have Director Daniels, Director Christensen, and the alternate being Director Jaffe. And I think Carl is the chair on that, didn't she? Yes, she is. Yes. Correct. Okay. And for the finance and administrative, I have uh, Director Christensen, uh, Director Daniels, and the alternate being Director Lather. I don't believe I have a change for that. Sounds good to me. OK, so do we have a? I move all those. Second. Director LeHue? Yes. Director Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Lather? Yes. So we go to agenda item 7.5. Okay. This is a, an item for uh, the district's country club well in Aptos. And um, the state implemented a maximum contaminant level for 123 TCP. And uh, the country club well uh, 
exceeded the five parts per trillion uh, limit. And therefore the well was taken out of service and it cannot be put online until treatment, uh, a treatment facility is built. So this effort is um, initiating the environmental review, the design of the treatment facility, as well as um, a replacement well, because if we build the treatment plant, there won't be enough room to, to replace the well. Um, the well doesn't show any, uh, any current indication that it's ready to fail. Um, however, it is 67 years old. And so we wanna plan accordingly. Um, so this, this item presents uh, four scopes of work, uh, one from uh, Rincon Consultants for the Environmental Review and Coastal Development Permitting, uh, one from Black & Veatch for Design uh, Engineering Services, and then a well design from Montgomery & Associates, they're the district's current hydrogeologist, and then an on-call uh, advisor from Corona Environmental Consultants who did the initial um, feasibility study and has been sort of the district's water quality um, consultant. And they've helped us with ammonia as well as hexavalent chromium and they're, they're following this uh, contaminant. The uh, budget for this year is short and therefore, um, we are asking the board to consider um, first um, shifting some funds to get us through this fiscal year. It, what's requested is 600000 to cover all the effort through June 30th. Um, the remaining work, which would not include uh, necessarily construction, would, would be um, you know, included in next fiscal year's budget if there's anything remaining. Um, I'm not sure we're, we're, we're quite, we don't necessarily have the bandwidth to, to go to construction this next fiscal year. It could be the, the following fiscal year. But so what's requested from OCR is just to get us through the rest of the fiscal year. And that concludes my report. Okay, so do we have any pu public comment on this item? We yes, do. we have one. Ms. Steinbrunner. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm curious why a construction company, Rincon, is in charge of doing the environmental assessment and work and working out the mitigations. I find that very curious that a construction company would be, in, be put in charge of this kind of work. Their, uh, according to their website, their specialty is demolition, paving, and grading. So um, I'm curious about that. I see on um, page 147 the uh, photo image. It's interesting to make it look like a house, and I think that's very creative um, and hopefully would address the noise impacts. What I'm curious about is that it looks, in reading the documents, that Already, without doing any environmental assessment at all, it is anticipated that it will be a mitigated negative deck. And I'm wondering how um, that can be done without any analysis at all. And I'm uncomfortable having a construction company be put in charge to take the reins of that kind of um, baseless, if you will, assessment. So I'm uh, happy to see that the backwash is considered non-toxic, being mostly uh, charcoal, but I want to know how that would be handled. And has there been outreach to the neighbors yet? Um, the noise impacts seem to address only the construction, and I really think that seconds. it needs to be, thank you, really needs to be c assessed for the operational. Um, <laughs> Boy, there's a lot. Um, I'm, I'm just a little worried about this. I'm very happy you're doing moving forward with the project. I'm sorry there's no money to do it. And it's because you've gone too far out on the limb with the Pure Water SoCal 
but I urge you to do it so that you can take this, put this well back into operation. I know in your recent document it is on Thank standby. You, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to set the record straight on Rincon. Their, um, their website says that they were founded in 1994 and have grown to be a leading environmental consulting firm throughout California. So I'm not sure what website um, Ms. Steinbrunner looked at, but it wasn't the correct one. So that concern can be alleviated right now. Um, any um, any comments from the board members? Yeah. Right. What? Hello? I have a question. Thank you, Tom. Um, so I, I was just curious, just so I have it in my mind, what the total, if, we, if Taj has some kind of an idea what the total price tag for this treatment plant by the time it's all done will be. I mean, I think, I mean, I'm happy that we're doing it. I think that you know, we're always trying to improve water quality and keeping that well and, and production will be important. But um, I, I just didn't have an idea, like this is pre-construction, just kind of where, what ballpark we're talking about. You know, this is pretty much like, unlike any other treatment plant that we've done uh, because of the neighboring homes. So I, I don't have uh, a figure to tell, to, to give you at this stage, but that is part of, part of this work we will be developing a, um, an engineer's estimate for, for going forward with construction. Um, you know, I could give you a, a good ballpark for the well replacement. That is something that we are pretty comfortable with. I think the board has seen um, wells typically range from 600 to, to $800,000 just to drill the well. Um, the, the other challenge that is unlike um, some of our other sites is that this does have a coastal development permit and um, we're not yet sure what the conditions of approval will be on that. So it is, it's hard to say. It's, it's definitely multi-million dollar uh, water treatment plant, you know, level. Um, right. I think our, our 30 year, uh, 20 year CIP, it was, it was well over 1.5 million mm -hmm. just for the treatment plan, but that may have excluded, you know, architectural um, costs. Right. And it, 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 at that time, it, it didn't uh, include a replacement well back when we put that together. And my guess, can I guess and see if I'm correct in that the reason for the likelihood of, of, a, of a negative deck, uh, initial study negative deck on this particular one is that A, wells are done frequently and it's replacing a well that's already there. And the second is that this treatment plant is, is well-established technology. And that is, is that correct? Um. Well, it's, it's relatively passive technology. Um, so other than, you know, construction noise, once it's in operation, it, it, it wouldn't be more noisy than what's there. Um, yeah, you know, the consultants did, did take some time to, to look at the site when they submitted their proposal. So, um, you know, it, it'll be what it is, and if if a mitigated negative deck is not appropriate, uh, then we'll 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 learn through that process. Uh, they'll do a preliminary checklist and, and go through that those steps. That's that's what they do for a living. So um, they're experts in in environmental review. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I agree with Taj. Um, the fact that we anticipate this is a level of review doesn't presuppose the the result and and we'll you know we will do the necessary analysis dr jeff jaffe do you have anything to add i don't i seem to have lost um dr daniels 
I have nothing you. either. I don't have anything, Rochelle. Thank you. And Carla? Sorry. I to, um, yeah, I'll just say, I just wanted to confirm that this is an important thing uh, to do right now. And also that we have enough staff at the district to cover Pure Water Soquel and this construction project, well drilling project, you know, because it is, it does sound like big effort and it's four different new contracts to oversee at the same time we're- uh, Right, um, thank you. I, I appreciate you having that concern. Um, at, at this stage, what, what you're considering is not, not construction contracts, it's all um, consulting contracts. Um, so a lot of the heavy lifting will be done by the consultants. Um, Mike Wilson is our associate engineer and he's already you know, done some of the preliminary review and he's done the, the outreach for the request for proposals. So, um, you know, it'll take some of his bandwidth, but they're going to do a lot of the heavy lifting and uh, we won't go into construction um, yet. So getting, getting this, these are the first steps to take in order to consider going into construction. And um, he's, he's one of our treatment plant um, most qualified staff members and he, he, can, he has the bandwidth at this time. Yeah. That's usually what you do is you get the, the studies done about two years before you actually end up constructing and that's how you keep them moving along. So um, I am completely comfortable with this project. I think it's important. And um, so I'm looking, is there anything else to say or do you wanna make a motion? Yes, Bruce? I will make both motions. Thank you. Second. Director LeHue. Yes. Director Daniels. Yes. Director Jaffe. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. And President Lather. Yes. Okay, so now we move on to 7.6 presentation and acceptance of the comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year 2019-20 and appropriate funds for the capital facilities reserve. I take it that this is going to this, be presented by? This will be Leslie. Leslie. Um, yeah, so good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just, at, when I say I'm going to present, and I actually, um, that was kind of, well, I lied. I'm, I'm not really going to present it. I'm going to have our, um, our audit partner present it to you. Um, but I just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of background this evening, a uh, special uh, commendation for Ryan Kinney, who put a lot of effort this year into pulling together the uh, financial report, working with the auditors. This was a first time uh, audit for this audit firm um, as our audit partners. And it, we also had the complication of, of the pandemic and working remotely. So Ryan has done just a tremendous job putting all of this together. And um, we usually, as part of the presentation of our, of our annual financial report, we talk about what funds we can appropriate for the capital facilities reserve. When we set that reserve up, we actually um, agreed to fund it uh, with any increase in um, unrestricted net position. And I just wanna point out this evening, and I think you probably already read this in the memo, although we experienced a gain in net position for the year, that gain was primarily in the area of um, capital assets. So it was a it was a increase in our um, net position invested in capital assets, not necessarily an increase in unrestricted portion. So we don't have any eligible funds to appropriate for the capital facilities reserve this year. So I just wanted to make that clear. And as as um, Mr. Foster goes through the uh, 
financial report, he'll kind of explain the, the increase in that position a little bit for you. But that being said, this evening we have Jonathan Foster from the, uh, Davis Farr, who is our new auditing firm. And he is a partner with the firm and he's here to go ahead and present the financial statements. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jonathan. He's gonna share his screen with you this evening. Thank you, Leslie, let me... Uh... I think I may need uh, permission to share. You should be able to share now. I stopped sharing this, oh, my screen. Gotcha. Okay. Perfect, we can see you, Jonathan. Okay, great. President Lather, um, thank you for, uh, and fellow board members, give me the opportunity to present the results of the audit. Uh, this will give me an opportunity to introduce myself. Um, as Les Leslie mentioned, this is our first year uh, auditing uh, So Soquel Creek Water District. Um, and please forgive if I mispronounce it. <laughs> um, I'll get started with the audit results. Um, so as Leslie mentioned, due to COVID-19, uh, the audit was performed uh, remotely. Um, and thank you to Leslie and Ryan. Um, finance staff was well prepared for the audit uh, and very responsive to all our requests, um, all our emails and uploading um, the amount of uh, support we needed. Um, audits are always labor intensive and uh, they did a great job helping us move it along remotely. Um, we hope to see everybody next year um, as things normalize um, and looking forward to uh, 2021. Uh, one of the things I like to do as part of the presentation um, is inform the board of any accounting standards um, that may have been significant during the year. Um, one of the things uh, that you will see that is uh, slightly different on the income statement this year um, affected your interest expense. Uh, so the district implemented GASB 89, uh, accounting for interest costs incurred before the end of a construction period. And I will go into more detail on that a little bit later in the presentation. As a result of COVID-19, uh, GASB, which is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, issued a new pronouncement, uh, which effectively postponed uh, a lot of the major uh, accounting pronouncements um, that were supposed to come into effect in the short term. Um, so there has been a delay anywhere between 12 and 18 months of upcoming accounting pronouncements due to uh, COVID-19. The reports we issued for the district, uh, we issue an opinion on the basic financial statements. We also issue a report on internal control over financial reporting. Um, if there was anything we wanted to bring to the board's attention regarding uh, either internal control or compliance uh, about the district, we would report it in this letter. So I'm happy to report. Uh, we did not have any matters to report in that letter. We also issue a summary of audit results, uh, just summarizing the results of the audit uh, and anything significant uh, that may have occurred that we wanted to report. Um, or if things went as normal and we issued a standard letter uh, there. Uh, I did wanna take a minute to note that the audit opinion was unmodified. Uh, this is the highest level uh, of an auditor's opinion you can get. And what it means is that as auditors, uh, we do not have to make uh, any modifications or qualifications to the opinion. Um, so issuing an unmodified opinion is the highest level uh, the district can receive. I just wanted to briefly mention uh, some of the places uh, that as auditors, we spend uh, some significant uh, amount of time in. Uh, internal controls, uh, this year uh, was interesting doing everything remotely, um, but we do evaluate uh, the district's controls uh, on an annual basis. Uh, so every year we will come in and perform walkthroughs of uh, certain transaction cycles of the district. Uh, capital assets, uh, we do look at your capital assets every year, um, especially look at uh, construction and process. Uh, we select a sample of projects um, and uh, interview both finance and engineering staff as to the status of those projects. In addition to that, we take uh, a close look uh, at your pension and OPEP obligations. Um, for your pension obligations, we get uh, actuary reports from uh, CalPERS. Um, so they report your net pension liability every year. And other post-employment benefits, uh, we take the district's third-party actuary actuary and report uh, the liability, liability information reported from them. We also uh, independently confirm with third parties uh, through the use of a service 
um, that works directly with the banks, um, all your long-term debt. Uh, so we confirm that 100% uh, uh, for purposes of financial reporting. I wanted to talk about some of the financial statement uh, highlights, uh, some of the changes you might notice when reviewing uh, the financial statements. Um, so one of the areas you'll see here, there's significant change in, um, and I like to call it uh, investment in yourselves. Um, your total assets overall increased about uh, nine and a half million. Um, it's a combination of a few things. Um, there was, uh, due to operating results, uh, an increase in accounts receivable, which is uh, um, basically short-term customer receivables to get realized in the next month. And then uh, capital assets. Um, so you'll see in that line, capital assets are not being depreciated. Um, and this is where a lot of the work the district performs that is being capitalized. Um, it does not go through the income statement. It goes through your balance sheet. Um, so a lot of the increase uh, in your total assets is as a result of investment in your district um, as reflected in, in CIP. Total liabilities, uh, overall there was an increase about 2.3 million. Um, one of those largest changes uh, was through accounts payable. Um, and that's again through the amount of uh, uh, capital asset, capital projects that are undergoing. Uh, this year, at the end of the year, you had some larger invoices uh, uh, still to be paid to some of your uh, contractors. Um, so that's a short-term uh, liability. Um, so you'll see that uh, larger increase in accounts payable. Um, one of the things you'll see as well, it was uh, slightly offset um, by your uh, pay down of your uh, long-term debt, your certificates of participation. Uh, moving on to your income statement, um, you will see an increase uh, in operating revenues. Um, that is due to a combination of uh, a slight increase in consumption uh, and a rate increase uh, that went into effect um, early last year. Uh, so the combination of two, those two things resulted in uh, that increase you'll see uh, in operating revenues. Um, another thing you'll see is operating expenses, uh, fairly consistent from year to year. Um, it was slightly offset, uh, source supply um, went dropped down slightly as you'll see there in the income statement. Um, and that's just due to um, some of those expenses, um, what we refer to as being capitalized instead of expense uh, in the current year. Um, and all that means it's going through the balance sheet into your uh, current uh, projects you're investing in. Um, so overall, um, you had positive results on the year. Um, so your operating income um, did reflect a a uh, higher jump than last year. Um, and again, that was mainly driven uh, by that increase in your uh, operating revenues. Uh, just the last part of the income statement, um, one of the items I wanted to point out here um, in case you had any questions. Um, so you will see uh, a uh, change in your interest expense um, from year over year. Um, and that is not because you incurred more debt. Uh, that is just because the implementation of an accounting standard, um, whereas you're recognizing uh, all the interest um, paid on your outstanding debt in the income statement. Um, and before that interest was recognized as a component of your projects, um, which was a standard uh, beforehand. Um, but now for consistency reasons, uh, the accounting board um, has uh, implemented a new accounting standard where all um, districts will now um, start recognizing uh, interest expense on the income statement going forward. Um, so again, just revisiting uh, your net position at the end of the year, um, at the very bottom here, you can see there was there was an increase in your net position. Um, and I like to point out that as always uh, uh, good news when you see um, the increase um, from year over year for comparison purposes. Uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to open it up for any questions from the board, if you may have any. Do we have to have um, public comment? Yes, we have one public comment. Let's go ahead and do that now. Hold on. I just got to get back to the timer one second. Do I stop sharing? Yes, I thank you. All right. Ms. Steinbrenner? Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for this good report. 
And I really want to thank um, Mr. Kinney for those excellent monthly financial reports that I now see in the board's packet. I appreciate that information very well, very much. And um, they're they're easy to read, um, not always accurate, <laughs> but you're getting there. So thank you for that information, and thank you for the presentation tonight. I have a question about um, – the, that the, there are, it, I'm bothered still by the last agenda item you had, that there's no money to build the T one two three TCP plant. There's also seemingly no money to build the quail run tank, and there's also the O'Neill ammonia treatment plant. And I'm really worried about the financial status here. Um, while it it's projected in the um, report that I just heard that income will increase um, and that it, and that's going to be tied to the rates. Your rates are going up again next month. But your production is down. That showed up in your documentation in item 4.2, I think it was. And it was also predicted by Raftelis in setting your rates. So to hear now that your liability has gone up by an increase, $2.3 million, dollars is worrying to me and I'm not even one of your customers so um, and I hear that your operating income is going up so your expenses are going up tremendously due to the Pure Water SoCal project um, it's, you're just weighing over your head on that and I'm worried and so are your customers I'm talking with them and I'm doubly worried now that I'm hearing this information Thank you, Ms. I appreciate Heimer. the monthly reports. I think the monthly reports are done by our staff, not by the accountants. And right. So, Bruce, do you have anything to say? Since <laughs> well, I think I think the monthly reports are done by our staff, not by the accountants we're talking to tonight. Right. So, um, words do. Who else has anything to say or any questions on the board? I think the report was a good report. So, I thank uh, Jonathan for you know, coming and doing all that. And I'd, I'd like to thank the staff for having it be to the point where it's an unmodified, you know, decisions or however it's worded. But I mean, that's the highest level that an auditor can give to to our finances so thank you to all the finance team for accomplishing that and then um i just i didn't know whether it was worth any finance people um clarifying the fact that just because we're moving money from ocr to some you know this is really the to you know it wasn't budgeted for that year doesn't mean we're having trouble having enough money to cover something Right. Yeah, that that's correct, Dr. LaHue. Um, when we move money out of OCR, it is it's simply because we didn't per budget for that particular project in this year's budget. Right. We may have planned for it in a finance plan at some point, but we didn't include it in this year's budget. So we we need to go ahead. That's what OCR is there for. When we have you know unexpected situations come up where a project gets gets escalated and it wasn't budgeted for that's that's what it's there for so um it's appropriate that we take that out of ocr thank you president later may, may yes. i make may i make a comment please you know this leslie and her team just do such an outstanding job i have to comment every time you know i i genuinely look forward to reading this document it is a really good snapshot of the district and so, you know, on a financial realm, you know, we're just so fortunate to have a CPA like Leslie, such, such a solid uh, leader in our organization. But to take it to a fun note, if you read this and, and, and actually just pulls you through, look at the photographs. She does that on her own time, and they're just not regular run-of-the-mill photographs. A lot of those are hers. Some of them are sent in by people, but it's just a classy document. And I, and I just, just a shout out all around on that. Thank you. It, it looks great. And 
I don't see any reason to be concerned financially. I think we're balancing our budgets and looking at the future in the way that we're supposed to. Um, did Tom, did you have any more to say? Oh, I'm good. Okay. So uh, I was just going to comment to go back to the monthly uh, finance reports too, that they, I take issue. They aren't inaccurate <laughs> that the data that went into the monthly also contributed to this audit report that culminated in getting a highest level of accuracy for an audit. So, you know, it's based on the data produced by those monthly reports. So they're intrinsically not inaccurate. They're, they're a monthly picture, a snapshot of what's going on in our district. But anyway, that's just, just saying that. Uh, no, I thought it was a really good report. Uh, we've discussed OCR over and over again, so I agree with Leslie. We all know what it means, you know, why that fund is there and what we use it for. So uh, I don't, it, it's not a reflection of the dire state of our uh, district. It's just amazing that we are able to address emergency big projects like this, uh, like the well and our Pure Water SoCal project. And it's a tribute to the staff that we really are keeping the balls up in the air is really good. So anyway, I don't that, I don't have any specific comment on the report, except that it's a very excellent report. Thank you. Thank you, Director Christensen. Director Jaffe. Yep. I just want to echo what the other directors have said that, uh, you know, f I have difficulty reading financial reports sometimes, but this one is, is very readable. So kudos to the, to the staff. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion that we accept the report. I will second. Oh, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Lather? Yes. So let me see where we are. 7.7. 7.7. Review and consider compensation for district directors. Is there a. Do you mean uh, President Lather and uh, directors? Uh, on an annual basis, the board um, considers its uh, compensation, um, and we do so under district ordinance and California Water Code. Um, the board member's current compensation uh, was adjusted uh, for the first time since 2007-2008 um, last year, and um, the board tonight is considering making an adjustment uh, to its compensation. Um, I presented the current compensation for board members at uh, $200 per day for attendance at regular meetings of the board, standing committee meetings. Um, for uh, service rendered that re involves out of town travel and the $100 rate per day for authorized service within Santa Cruz County. Um, as attachments to the memo, I've included the history of the director's annual compensation adjustments to show which, um, you know, what adjustments have been made. And I've also included information in regards to um, the director um, health and welfare benefits uh, for the 2021 um, plan year to um, districts uh, board members have the option to participate in the um, district's benefits uh, for employees. And so out of pocket costs oftentimes are adjusted based upon rate increase, premium rate increases for our health plan. So tonight um, you have a, uh, some motions to consider if the board is interested in making an adjustment to its compensation level. Um, uh, if there's any adjustment made to that $200 per day and or to the $100 per day, um, those motions are before you tonight to consider. Is there public comment on this item? No. Okay, so Bruce. I had a question on page 288 second paragraph from the bottom 
-hmm. It talks about a maximum of 298.43. But then on the next page, the motions talk about a maximum of 261.43. So I'm a little confused as to what the real maximum is. Not that we would do the maximum, but. Sure, that, um, I, I see what you're, I, I see that um, it, it actually is 298.43 um, and that's reflected on the chart um, for the 2021. So the motion is not quite correct then. Correct, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that correction. No, no problem. Yes, Tom. <laughs> hey, I would just be in favor of not changing anything. I second that. Well, it was discussion. It wasn't an official motion, but. <laughs> well, that's, that's take no action. Yes, item number four. Yes. <laughs> Anybody hey. else have anything to say? I've got the same sentiment. Yeah, okay. And if there's consensus on number four, there are no motions required. Then we're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we can move on. I think we all agree. Yep. We will move on to the next item, which is 7.8 2020 year in review slideshow. Oh, goody. Do we get popcorn? <laughs> If you made it for yourself. <laughs> I got some virtual popcorn for you. There we go. <laughs> Becca and Melanie uh, are taking this one. Thank you. Of course they are. Melanie, are you introducing it or am I just hit and play? I don't think that there needs to be an introduction. So I think okay. go ahead and play it, Becca. Thanks, you guys.
Thank you. Yeah, nice. That was very nice. You might have wanted a more recent picture of me. I've gained weight since then. <laughs> Oh, it's a nice picture. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, well, I hope it wins an Emmy this year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do we have public comment for this? No. Okay. Um, it, it was beautiful. One, one thing I would suggest, though, is if there's more than two items on a slide, if there's a way to make it a, last a little longer because I was like trying to speed read through it all. <laughs> there were some great slides and I've missed some of um, the information. But anybody else? I'd like to see it again. Yeah. Not, not tonight, but I'm going to go on to and see it again. Maybe can there's a lot in there. We can send you a link. That'd be awesome. Yeah, there was a lot in there. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so now we have, we don't have a motion or anything for that, right? No. no. Okay, no. Um, so there's consent agenda items that were pulled for discussion. Was that 4.2? 4.2, yes. Was there a public comment yes. for that? Okay. Thank you. Yes, there's one. No, John Cole. Mr. Cole? Yeah, you got me. I get three minutes, don't I? Oh, no, only two. No, you minute. only get two. Okay. Go ahead. I'll, I'll make this really quick. Uh, by the way, that PowerPoint was beautiful. I That was, the transition between slides was pretty quick, uh, but it was well done. Um, I just have three items here that I hope you can discuss and take action on. Um, first, request staff to fix the error that's on the number of customer graphs, as I pointed out in both my letter and my email. And they also ask staff to report MFR and SFR data separately because the usage patterns of these classes are dissimilar. For example, for the number of customers in each tier graph, if that were done, it would show that for July, 75% of MFR customers consumed only tier one, while 53% of SFR custom, customers consumed only tier one water. Thus, 25% of MFR customers consumed tier one and tier two, while 47% of the SFR customers consumed tier one and tier two water. And last, um, Request staff to reinstate the monthly water billings by tier by customer class graph. That's a really, really important graph. And I heard Dr. Lahu already indicating that in the last discussion. And I really do want to say, I did appreciate all the discussion you had regarding my correspondence. I, I want to thank you for that. That, that was very nice. Uh, I, I did appreciate it. I just hope that the future meeting or clarification happens sooner than later. And that's, that's all I have, but uh, go for it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all your uh, work in trying to figure this all out. <laughs> okay, so um, I had a question. board member pulled this. Was that you, Tom? Yeah, I mainly pulled it for Mr. Cole um, because of his request, but I actually had a little question of my own on page 47. Um, just something I want to be able to understand. Just the change in March in the grant. I'm um, just, is there a particular chunk of grant money coming in that that month? That's under the fourth thing down under March 21. So what we we have. This is Leslie again. Sorry, we've projected on the cash flows. We have projected some grant money money coming in. Mm -hmm. But that that line is the grants and revolving line of credit draw. So any ancillary money we need to be able to pull from a grant reimbursement, from WIFIA, from a revolving line of credit, that's where that's that's coming from. I don't anticipate that being grant revenue. I anticipate it's needing to go ahead and draw from the revolving line of credit. Okay. Okay, that, thank you. It's just anticipated cost that month. 
All right. That was my only question, actually. I okay. Don't think this requires the report. So. No, but it, um, it's, it needs to be approved, right? A motion to approve it. Um, Leslie, since he was asking about the grant stuff, are we already receiving grant proceeds? Um, we did have some grant proceeds come in in 2020 that were the last of the implementation or the planning grant proceeds. Okay. What we're anticipating for the um, implementation grant is we probably won't see proceeds from our first submission, which was just done in November. Um, we probably won't see that until um, we're, we're looking probably six to 12 months out before we see those funds. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, we can draw with you much quicker, quicker than that. We can draw on the revolving line of credit very quickly. But the uh, state funds for both the SWIC loan, um, when, we, when we solidify that, and for the implementation grant, the state doesn't move as quickly on, on their disbursements, and it's usually at least six to 12 months out from when you submit your request. Okay, well, thank you. Anybody else have a question? Um, Bruce, your lips are moving, but there's no sound. I'm muted. No, no question. Um, I, since we're on this on the finance report, and and uh, Mr. Cole has made a request to bring back some of the information in the reports that we had in prior years. Um, my question to the board would be: Would that be useful information for you to have? I'm happy, it does take staff time. This has to be manually assembled. So it does take staff time to pull this data together. But if there was information on those older reports that you would like to see come back, we can certainly consider that. Yeah, and um, can I have a clarification about the, the number on the customer graph? Is that actually not customers, but dwelling units? So on page 46, you have two graphs. One is the tiered consumption. The top one is tiered consumption in units for each tier. The second graph is the number of customers consuming water in each tier. Now you can't consume tier two water until you've first gone through 5.99 units of tier one water. Up a little bit more on the graph. Um, so that's why if you add tier one and tier two customers together, like Mr. Cole is doing, you're going to come up with more customers than we have in the district. But that's because the first, you know, roughly six units of consumption for each of those tier two customers, they're consuming that in tier one and they're being charged a tier one rate for it. So the purpose behind these graphs was actually to recreate the analysis that Raftelis had done when they did the rate study. And so it doesn't, we have, to, we have to analyze the data in the same way that they did it in order to get a comparison to their proposed or their projected um, analysis. Now I so, was, yeah, I was thinking that some of it would be like, you, let's say you have a apartment complex with 200 people, I mean, 200 um, living units, even though that's one customer, yeah, we didn't we didn't break it out that to that granular a level okay. in terms of the customer count. We didn't break it down into dwelling units. These are um, not necessarily what you consider uh, customers population wise, but we would consider a customer account. Okay. Okay. So there are you know thirteen thousand four hundred and seventy six customer accounts that consumed water in Tier One in July, and there then another should... six thousand. Maybe we should rename it number of accounts consuming water because that would make it clearer. I can certainly do that. Yeah, the reason um, he, Leslie's done it this way because that's exactly how it's named in the Raptelis report. And the board requested this a while back to, uh, you asked, is, are, is what they estimated uh, coming to fruition? And so she, what she's done is here replicated that so you can see that, and I think the answer is yes. Uh, it's very much reflecting, uh, almost you know, very much to what uh, Raptelis had predicted. But it was a board request for that reason, to see if that usage and the way the breakout was. 
but I could I can certainly turn that from number of customers to number of accounts if that helps clarify things a little bit. Um, but the Raftella study was actually he didn't break it down into single family and multifamily in his analysis. He broke it down into residential consumption. So that's why this isn't broken out separately into single family and multifamily. Now, if you if you find value in this information, I can continue to report it. If you don't find it that useful, then we can also discontinue reporting it. I've got a suggestion. When we eventually sit down and look at what Mr. C uh, Cole is uh, uh, wanting and what we've got, it would be nice to have both of them up so we could compare them and contrast them. That's a great right idea. Now, right now, I don't know how to even compare them, so. Great. Well, I, I thought the purpose of this, and I don't remember who requested it, might have been me actually, but. It was. <laughs> <laughs> It's my fault, um, <laughs> is to just see whether or not the projections that Raf Tellus made were, were holding. Right. So it, I don't see, it's not obvious to me. Well, from, they said that 30% of consumption would be in tier two, the 70% the, the would be in tier one. For all months. No, right for, for an entire yeah, year right. so so when you get to the bottom graphs you've got two different graphs we've given you a um, fiscal year to date assessment and then we've also provided you with a 12 month rolling average so that you can see over 12 months over the previous 12 months the average consumption per tier you can also see it fiscal year to date which would just be from july through the current period so really to compare to raf tell us is projections the only one that that the only required graph is the, ro the 12 month rolling average probably yeah because the fiscal year to date average depending on whether you're in the summer or winter right it's going to be it, higher it, it, it's going to go up and down so yeah i and this this data is tracking really close, actually better, performing better than, than Sanjay had anticipated. We have yeah. fewer customers consuming in tier two than he had even assumed we would have. Right. And then I'd make the suggestion that there be just a little explanation that tier one inc includes all customers who have both tier one and tier two usage. Okay. So it because it it's not. Yeah, it's not intuitive. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, according to these graphs, it's just people who are only using tier one. Because you notice you add the, the red and the blue, and it's one hundred percent. Well, this is just residential customers. Yes. But the people that are in blue are people who are just using tier one. People right. in red are using both tier one and tier two. Mm, no, uh, no, that's the, the no, confusion. that's that's the confusion. The number of customers or number of accounts. Yeah, the number of customers people. consuming water in each tier. So you do have some tier two customer customers that are consuming water in tier one, well, six units worth to. before they get to tier two. Yeah, they have to. They have to, right? Yeah. But wouldn't that but when the get, back, okay, by this graph on the right lower, it's still saying 75% of the customers are not going into tier two. Yes. Because they add them oh. up, it's 100%. Is that correct? Yeah. It's the, the average number of customers uh, that are consuming an, water in each tier. No, I, I don't know. No, it's not. No, I want to know how many customers are only staying in tier one and how many are I agree with that and, and this okay. doesn't show that because it has right. tier one the tier one includes customers that are only staying in tier one yes. plus customers who are have both tier one and tier two. Right. So I can I can I can do that analysis and I can present that information, but that's not going to correlate with Raf analysis. 
I just want a feeling for how many people are being affected by their their unit rate going from seven dollars to thirty dollars. Okay. That's yeah. thirty percent. That's, that's what I wanted initially. Too. <laughs> That's the but I don't know if that's true. Um, that, that's the kind of information I think I would like. And, but, but I think it's not appropriate to make that decision now. That's why I think Bruce's yeah. suggestion and my goal too was to come back with, you know, here's the alternate ways to present this information and what's most valuable, what's most transparent for everyone, but also what's most valuable for making decisions going forward. And then okay. we can pick out the ones that are best and just have those. Right. And and I I I second what Tom's saying. I'd like to see how many people are staying in tier one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you can figure it out from this thing. It's if it's twenty five percent in tier the you tier can. two. You're right. Yeah, I mean it's self evident that one but third of the of no, the you can't you can't do it by no you can't by we'll percentage. Bring it back. We'll What's bring up? it back. It's we can obvious. we can bring it back. Yeah. I think now is not the time. Yeah, not not this time of night. No, <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it the information is there though. But you're right; it has it, we you know it has to be teased out. Yes. Well, you I think the important track. thing here is that what was predicted in the rate study uh, is is accurate, and that's what the data has shown out. And I think that's what the board asked for a while back. And so maybe that no longer serves you. We'll, we'll bring back things like how, how many people are in tier one or tier two, and you can select from there. But um, and maybe also, just run its course. And also for a discussion, how many, you know, the different classes to see if that's instructive oh, that helping us set rates in the future. Mm -hmm. okay. But just for, for now, though, just consider that. 100% of our customers are in tier one. 20, you know, one third of the, those customers approximately are use more than tier one water and they're fall into tier two. And that's what they have to pay for. They have to pay that money, the extra money. So the information is all there. We don't have 20,000 customers. It's that misleading. It's that misleading. Just so, not clear. And so. you know, because you subtract, if you look at uh, July, you subtract the 6,000 tier twos from the 13,000 plus tier ones and you get 7,000 in tier one. But that's and not what you do. That's not what it is. That's what, that's how you would track how many are only tier one. percent of our customers are in tier one and 25, you know. I, I, I'm gonna sit well, well, never mind. We can talk. back uh, to uh, make it easier for facilitate discussion. Yes. yes. The way it's the way these things are set up right now, the blue is people who are just in tier one, and the reds are people who are in tier one and tier two. Correct. Is it? Yeah, yes. Hundred percent of our customers are in tier one. You know, some of them spill over into tier two. That's right. that's the basic answer. That's not what the graph shows. The graph shows how many are in tier one only, and how many are in tier one and tier two, which is red. Either I think you need to move. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we're going to need to have a item that compares this because I don't I don't agree with that. But that is for another day, I think. Um, but we do need a motion to. Do we? No, I don't think so. It's information, yeah. isn't it? Either this oh. is it report um so we don't need a, a motion thank you okay good good this is my first meeting you guys made it tough on me <laughs> <laughs> but it's yet to come so the next item on there is adjournment is that right <laughs> in favor of adjournment <laughs> i will it's adjourn the meeting do i get a gavel <laughs> You survived yeah, your first well, meeting. Congrats. We need a bell, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. all right. Congratulations on your first. You did a very good job. Don't worry. <laughs> See you yeah. in 2020. Later. I kind of lost my focus there on what. <laughs> Thank you, board. Thank right. you. Bye. See you next year. Bye. See you next year. <laughs> <laughs>